We do not discuss the event. Hello, fellow survivors. I'm Pruitt. This is Jim Davis. And it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel like playing some D&D. &D. Let's get our water, our Rad X, and our iodine tabs, and talk the post-apocalypse on WebDM. <laughs> Let's begin after the end. Mm. The post-apocalypse. Ah. Uh, it's, it's over. Yes. But, but we're still here. But we're still here. Civilization goes on. I like post-apocalyptic gaming. As, as in just a, a genre of fiction, it's one of my oh, favorites. Yeah. You know, for me, it starts with the OG of all apocalypses, Revelation. At, which, is, at the age of 11, I attempted to turn the book of Revelation into a role-playing game. That's a little-known fact that you guys might not know about me. That's uh, fucking epic. Because <laughs> as someone who was raised Pentecostal, <laughs> Trust me, the, the apocalypse was the only thing on all of our minds. Oh, sure. so, like, uh, we're talking about some sort of cataclysmic event that ends civilization and affects everyone in it. We're not talking about just a, a, you know, a disastrous war or a famine or something plague. like that, a plague, but ones in which it is such a body blow to that civilization that it cannot survive. It cannot mm. go on uh, in its current form. It's one of those things that I think fantasy is at its heart, particularly the kind of fantasy that's, that's in the traditional sort of Dungeons and Dragons-esque uh, type fantasy. At its heart, the, the, the apocalypse and the aftermath of the apocalypse is baked in to fantasy because fantasy is based on medieval history and medieval history obviously you know has its own apocalyptic event or actually several uh, that, <laughs> that that but the defining one being the collapse and disintegration of the western half of the Roman Empire the conversion of the eastern half to its more uh, you know to the Byzantine uh, type form and the the taking over of the western empire by various uh, Germanic groups is a apocalyptic event, a society ends. Yeah. And while the people are still there and they adapt and, and grow and change, and I'm a huge fan of late antiquity, the early uh, medieval period, it's fascinating and there's so many great things you can learn for your own games for D&D for it, but you can start to see these historical events, the migrations of, of mass Germanic tribes as they move across the Roman border, that they, they come in as client peoples, they, they serve in the army, now they're taking over whole parts of it. That, those events, become mythologized as sort of like these heroes and gods and epic struggles and then they are then recorded by early Christian monks who then transmit them to us. You can see these kernels of historical truth that get mythologized and then they influence sort of what comes later and that's a good model to sort of bring in to your Dungeons and Dragons games. Mm -hmm. and, and an understanding of like, because that's in medieval history and because medieval history is so strongly influenced uh, for the, the fantasy genre, that like post-apocalypse stuff is, is baked in. How yeah. many fantasy worlds have you played in or thought up or, or read about or heard of that there was a fallen civilization and, and, and things used to be great and wonderful and there was a golden age and, mm -hmm. and now we're in the ashes of that and that's where all these ruins and dungeons and the like come from. Right. Right. I mean, both of our worlds, that, that yeah. describes them. Absolutely, absolutely does. And describes so many of the published settings of Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. And I like to think of post-apocalyptic gaming as sort of, is the apocalyptic event a slow event? Mm -hmm. or, or a fast one? Is it something that's a gradual decline or a sudden collapse? Right. And then the other axis is, did it, is, is it either concurrent or, or very recent? Mm -hmm. Or is it a long time in the past? And the integration of that, slow, fast, near, distant, creates this sort of quadrant uh, that, you can, that you can then plug in. And you can say, well, my apocalypse is, is a long time ago. Yeah. And it was a slow collapse. So maybe there are some records that were kept of it. There's there's something there that uh, that the players might know about, but maybe it's been transmitted through the, 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 the lens of mythology. And I'm using these elements of this apocalyptic event that's in my setting to drive events now in the campaign, but the players are gonna have to figure out what's myth and what's not, what's a lie and, and what's the truth. You know, maybe there's even powerful magic that lets them observe the event or, or travel back there or something or talk to someone who was there or, or mm -hmm. something like that. That's a different kind of, uh, of a post-apocalyptic event as opposed to the uh, it's happening right now and it is fast and it like <laughs> that this is the like the 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 classic like zombie apocalypse yeah the type, zombie right? apocalypse yeah yeah it's like last week things were fine now everything's gone to shit mm -hmm. all of society is broken down uh, you know people don't know what to do and desperate people do do you know 
wicked things because they're desperate and, and times are tough. There's elements in these that I think uh, are common to each of the four types, but there's also a uh, there's also something unique to each one that makes them special and, and interesting to play in. What's your favorite apocalypse that uh, medieval uh, Europe went through? <laughs> so I think Black like, Death. What do you think? I mean, like the Black Death is a good apocalyptic event because it's sort of like it's got overtone. A good apocalyptic event. It, you know, it's the I benefit. That's the benefit of, uh, of of several <laughs> centuries worth of, uh, of of time passage. You can talk about those kind of things. It has the hallmarks of kind of a zombie apocalypse, right? It's sudden, mm -hmm. it's fast, no one knows what's going on, it's mm -hmm. terrifying. Uh, reading accounts from people, you know, who, who survived it, uh, talking about like just empty villages. Yeah. And, and or, or meeting groups of people on the road who have been afflicted by the plague and they're just like desperate for some right, right. kind of, uh, of help. But the dehumanizing aspect of it, the fact that you're scared to like touch other people. Maybe or scared be to near touch them. or be near them. Yeah, they, yeah. And they, they don't have an idea of what germ theory is or, or how the disease disease is transmitted so there's all these like weird superstitions and things that come up there are a few attempts of like trying to understand the disease and there are some accounts of people of, like doctors and, and priests who were with dying people who then catch the disease themselves and, and some of them like survive and they write about their experiences there it's cataclysmic and mm -hmm. it changes the structure of society and you can see like from in like a macro historical sense like there's one trajectory that happens then there's the black death and there's all these other changes that kind of start cropping up that mm -hmm. maybe would have taken longer to get there or or maybe might not have happened at all mm -hmm. uh, that are a result of that like massive depopulation. Uh, where do you start thinking about like the features of your post-apocalyptic setting? Like what ended the world, like how it affects the world that the players are living in? Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. I, I think for me, it's it's working through the implications of the type of apocalypse that you had. So if it was like fast and a long time ago, then there might not be any records of it. And the impact uh, of that event on the society might be imperceptible. The, the people that are living through that society might not have any idea that this thing happened. They're just sort of living through the aftermath of it. Or they do have an idea uh, of something that happened, but it, it's more of a, a cultural memory type. There's no like records or something. It's just like, yeah, there was the troubles or the calamity or the cataclysm or, or something happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't really know. Going back to the nature of the event itself is gonna determine a lot about how your setting reacts to it. If this cataclysmic apocalyptic event happens in the middle of a session, for instance, it's result of play, then you're gonna have to figure out what happens sort of afterwards for your setting. What is it about the nature of the event that influences the setting? Is it something like, uh, you know, a magical devastation of some kind? I'm thinking like in Greyhawk, there are these two cataclysms. There's like, I, I, my Greyhawk lore is, is a little dull uh, at the moment, but there's like two the, these two empires and they're sort of at war with each other. The, I believe they're like they're called like the Baklunish Empire and maybe the other one's the Sewell Empire. But they unleash these like cataclysmic magics on each other and it devastates uh, portions of the world. It results in like massive migrations of the survivors of these civilizations have to leave the area that they were in. They go from being these sort of sophisticated magic using sort of like highly sophisticated cultures to more barbarous nomadic uh, kind of civilizations because that's that's how they had to survive. That's one way of sort of doing a magical uh, cataclysmic apocalypse. Another would be like the dark sun approach uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of what I did. I, my own uh, Land Between Two Rivers is a um, more of a, a blend of those two, Greyhawk and Dark Sun. But Dark Sun is more like there's this type of magic that that eats away at the world and and destroys plant matter and, and grass and and like the use of this magic is is devastating to the environment it's the it's the use of it over time and then the fact that there's all these sort of empires that exist in dark sun's prehistory that that seem to not care at all about the ramifications and the consequences of using mm -hmm. this magic until yeah. eventually you get to the burnt world of athos where fucking every plant is psionic and you know it's like right. ultra deadly. Yeah, <laughs> nuclear radiation. And so like Land Between Two Rivers is, is similar to that. There is a distinct event, a uh, magically induced event that causes ecological and environmental devastation and then following that massive use of global scale magic to, in, to engage in this protracted war that finishes the job. And, and now, however many centuries it is, I keep that deliberately fuzzy. Uh, the people who are there, they, you know, they have no memory of that. No one was alive for any of this business. Mm -hmm. uh, it, they just have to deal with the fallout of it. And the fact that the people responsible for it left. You know, the people responsible for the way the world was also had the means to 
gate themselves out of there. Yeah. Well, uh, we're done here. <laughs> we're done here. Let's go home and like, right. clock out. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and so like that's kind of a, a magical cataclysm. There are others that are more like uh, you know induced by gods or or deities or something. I'm thinking like dragon lance, you know, or the meteor that uh, oh, yeah. strikes the the the, the, ca the cataclysm. The cataclysm, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, if I'm remembering my dragon lance right, it's because it was like the 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 forces of good had become ascendant and yep. were starting to the, impose. They were too powerful. And... Yeah. It's time to, <laughs> as Ultron says, <laughs> throw a stone at it. <laughs> right. The gods are yeah. a way to in, uh, wreak devastation and havoc on your world. The one that's my favorite that I like is Midnight, where the evil god Isrador tricks the other gods into banishing him to, to, the, to the world and then seals it off from their influence. And yeah. so it's like, it's kind of like a Rorschach, you're stuck in here with me now yeah. kind of situation where it's, there's only one God, that God is evil as fuck. That God has corrupted every mortal hero who has ever gone after it to try to overthrow it. It, it doesn't destroy them or kill them, it turns them. You know, it, it, it co-ops them and, and now those are villains who, you know, who rule over the setting and like you just have to scrape and survive for everything. The dead come back to life no matter what you do. You've got yeah. to like bury them with rocks on top of them, uh, you know, upside down so that they mm -hmm. claw in further into the earth. And, and as a post-apocalyptic setting, it's phenomenal because it's like the enemy is one. The enemy is everywhere. They have magic sniffing animals that know when you're using magic coming after you. They keep you in a state of starvation and, and oppression so that you can't, um, you know, fight back. And then, you know, you dump some PCs in there and tell them, have, make the world a better place. Have fun. So those are kind of like magically and, 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 and like deity level induced cataclysms and sort of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of, you know, things that you can do with them. There's so many others. Monsters, whether it's like a Tarask or a Kraken or zombies and shadows. Right. The, the, right. The, yeah, the God, mean, well, the Godzilla, like what if Godzilla actually just kept going? Right. Just didn't stay at Tokyo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it just cuts a swath of devastation across the landscape. What are there two or three Tarasks? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, right. and the Tarask, I think, in, in some part of its lore is an apocalypse beast, yeah. right? Like, it shows up at the end of the world. It is the mm -hmm. creature that is there to destroy the world. Yeah. Uh, in some uh, in some versions of the D and D lore, so there's more mundane stuff like civilizational cycles mm -hmm. and you know war and conquest and disease. So now that you've you have your apocalypse for whatever reason, yeah. Like what are some of the things that when you when you look at a post-apocalyptic setting, it's like, oh, it needs that. It needs you gotta that. have this. You gotta have, you know. Yeah. You, you need you need your broken lands. Right. You, you, you know. <laughs> you need your mutants that that just want to be cannibals. Right. I mean, like, what do you need uh, for yourself hmm. in your post-apocalypse? In my post-apocalypse, I like to have charismatic leaders who are who wield power through force of personality. Uh -huh. And this is a very, uh, I, I find this to be a, uh, a, a sort of a, a very modern kind of... Uh, God, we're fucked. <laughs> a kind of, <laughs> sorry, a very modern uh, interpretation of it, right? Because like modern states are, are built on sort of bureaucratic power uh -huh. and the fact that it doesn't matter who holds the office, it's the office itself that derives authority and legitimacy, of course, from the people that it rules over, blah, blah, blah. We're not here to discuss political theory. But you, you see in like, you see it in tons of movies. Like I can't think of a single post-apocalyptic movie that doesn't feature an antagonist who gets by by force of personality. Whether it's Lord Humongous or Negan or fucking Dennis Hopper from Waterworld, yeah. they are all like, larger than life uh -huh. assholes who who gather a posse of rough men and mm -hmm. and and rule their little petty fiefdom. Yeah. Uh, or or they use uh, uh, personality or the struggle of the post-apocalypse itself, like say Hunger Games, right? To to continue to wield power, and you know you can see that in sort of like uh, Roman history, right? Like you can look at you know some of the things that like the Roman elites did, in in which they withdraw from public life, they start building these. Uh, compounds, these these sort of fortified villas, and then they start telling the people that are on them whether they're slaves or free, like, well, you know, you don't pay taxes to the tax collector anymore. Just give them to me, and I'll take care of you. And we've got these barbarians around here. We're going to hire them. They're going to they're, everything's going to be fine. So what you do find is that the people who have power before the apocalypse tend to have power after the apocalypse as well, because power is power. You could translate that into your fantasy games by having it be like, all right, so the kingdom has collapsed, but is they're not a, a duke or a count or a satrap or whatever uh, that's there who forms a, a, the, the nucleus of whatever new state 
that emerges afterwards, or whatever new civilization mm -hmm. or the survivors of one. And that's one characteristic of it that I that I like to include within uh, within the games. It works for the heroes as well, right? Rick, this Rick from Walking Dead is, you know, the same thing. He, he's a charismatic leader who wields mm -hmm. authority through his force of personality, with a veneer of sort of like principledness and all this other stuff. But he's just the same as the others, yeah. you know. Extensively, yeah, he's a good man. <laughs> but then you're like, mm. right. But I mean, if you're talking about like just post-apocalyptic genre, it, it's full of more. It, it's less of like you know the, the protagonist is usually as bad as the antagonist. It's just they have the veneer of being principled that they're trying to do the right thing, right. but they do the wrong thing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> in service of trying to right, do the right, right. thing. Uh, another hallmark of it for me is sort of a scarcity of both resources and information. Particularly for information, uh, an apocalyptic event is one, unless it was gradual and, and the society that was undergoing it knew what was happening and transmitted information on to whoever the survivors would be so that they could carry on that information, then your chances are that the, the apocalyptic event is a break in information. That chain of information is important for your setting because it, it, it gives you a veil of secrecy mm -hmm. to add in a whole bunch of stuff. And you can have like, okay, all of this stuff happened pre-apocalypse and, you know, and it's there in the background. The players post-apocalypse are, are gonna have to work to uncover that information. They're gonna have to go to that ruined location. They're gonna have to resurrect that entombed warrior who you know who was present for the thing. They're going to have to commune with the spirit of the dead by going to the land of the dead and finding someone who was there to, to tell them about what happened during that time. But something happened during that apocalypse that's vital for what's going on in the game world now is one way you can sort of, number one, share that information and make those events relevant to your current, uh, you know, to your current uh, campaign world. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, a good example of that in 12 Monkeys. Right. They're in the post-apocalypse sending people back in time trying to figure out what the what fuck in the hell happened. happened. Yeah, yeah. What the fuck happened yeah. here, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, 12 Monkeys is a great example of that. And a fun way to, to use uh, time travel, proactive time travel, like kill the guy that did this, responsible for this. Yeah, um, kill the wrong guy. Well, now you gotta kill this guy. <laughs> <laughs> the scarcity of information uh, is, is one of the hallmarks of it. And not just information about what happened pre-apocalypse, mm -hmm. but information about what's going on in the rest of the world. Yeah. Part of the hallmark of, 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 of an apocalyptic world or a world suffering or recently recovering from an apocalypse is just a breakdown in the social structure that prevents the rapid spread of information yeah. that having a well-run, highly sophisticated society will give you. Yeah. And so maybe it's a case of just like one village does not know what the next one's going through. And maybe mm -hmm. it's not even a case of, uh, of lack of trying. It's just they don't, as far as anyone knows, it's just us. We've never seen anyone else, or right. you know, or we do occasionally, but you know, it, it's tense. A great example of that to me is like Mad Max, like yeah, yeah. how nobody really knows who killed the world, you know, right, right, like, right, or like how it happened. Like some people do, some people do, and there's sort of the the audience does certainly because right. of the intros to the movie. But yeah. you you get the sense that the people within the world, particularly if you're watching like all all four of the movies, sort of first Mad Max. They're still a functioning society yeah, of some kind. They yeah. got cops. Yeah. They got stores. People live in just homes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's infrastructure. There's whatever, but you can see it starting to collapse. Yep. You can see the breakdown there. This personally, this is why I love the Mad Max movies because they tell this macro story across mm -hmm. all three of them. You know, there's cops. There's there's infrastructure. There's a semblance of society, but it's starting to break down. It's dangerous to go get from town to town. Right. There's stretches of road where. You really shouldn't be on them. And guess mm. what? Chances are you know someone in your family who lived in America when it was like this. And there's not, ba I'm not talking about like bandits in America, but there are times like say in before say the World War II where getting from place to place in America isn't exactly a, 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 an easy or completely safe experience. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? And, yeah, and depending tell me, on Jim, who you I, are I, and the yeah. parts of country you're traveling through, it might be a very dangerous experience yeah. for you. I played Oregon Trail. I know what it's like to cross <laughs> to Fort <Tafora> River. <laughs> Of course, you get to Road Warrior, and now it's like the oil refinery people mm -hmm. who have had to defend this oil refinery all Guzzling. on their own. Yeah. And and they know something's up, right? Like, they were used to work here. This mm -hmm. used to be their job. But now they are desert barbarians who happen to be at a gasoline oasis. Yeah. And then you get to Thunderdome, and it's like all of it is gone. That no one remembers. And there are now children 
present who weren't, don't really remember uh -huh. anything pre-apocalyptic, you know, yep. that kind of thing. And it's, it's just about gratuitous indulgence in the now in the to now. take your mind off of what the fuck's going on out there. Right, Let's right. go to the Thunderdome and have some crazy adventures. Right. You right. know? That's what Barter Town is. It's yeah. just sort of like, uh, come here and, and, and sort of indulge that. So taking those three movies as kind of an example, you can sort of see how this might have happened in your own setting. And if you want to use an apocalyptic event in your own setting, you can start to see like, okay, here's what it would look like. Maybe it does start out gradually. But as the, as the breakdowns build up and build up and build up, and as the things and entities and institutions in your campaign world fail to address those things, mm -hmm then there will be consequences. Maybe it's a magical devastation that, that is, is too much for the country of your, of your setting to deal with. That leads to a breakdown in society as the villages and towns and kingdoms of this place cannot cope with the changes, which leads to monsters moving in and taking over portions of your setting and, and dealing sort of the death blow to the kingdom that suffered this thing, uh, this cataclysmic event. And now you're at, you know, now you're at the place where you're playing and you've got a shattered kingdom, ruined cities all over the place, empty villages, towns that are, are bristling with defenses and keeping everyone and everything out, and a countryside that's filled with monsters and bandits and desperate people, and there's no order, no structure, no authority to turn to. Well, that's fucking a, it, ripe for adventure. Yeah. Like that is the, that, just like throw the players in there, give them, <laughs> give them an idea of what's around and, and watch them forge their own path through this chaos. But then you go to scarcity of, of resources, resources and right. what that does to people, like you were saying, when there's a lot of strife and, and, and natural disasters, well, that's mm -hmm. gonna disrupt society, which means processing of food and, and its, its movement around, uh, so people are gonna start starving. Right. There's gonna be, now people start dying, mm -hmm. then you have disease, yeah. and it, it like one thing leads to another. One thing leads to another, and then you, you sort of have a whole system collapse because it, the different constituent parts of it start to break down and mm -hmm. cannot recover quickly enough. Right. And so like, the scarcity of resources is a hallmark of, of, of post-apocalyptic gaming. Either it's sort of like the zombie apocalypse style of like, okay, how many bullets do we have? How right. many bandages do we have? We've got to raid this convenience store, which has already been picked over several times mm -hmm. while dodging enemies that are ever present and, and have a contagious sort of uh, bite. Uh, like, that's one thing. But you can also go with the scarcity of resources of like, okay, the apocalypse was a long time ago. We don't really remember it, but we have yet to build our civilization back up to the place that it was before. Mm -hmm. And in terms of our own history, that's a thing where it's like, yeah, the, the Roman Empire, there are levels of industry there that, that at least in, in European history are not seen again until the 18th or 19th centuries. It's like, it's like you know, nearly two millennia later that yeah. you're starting to get that. If you transport that to your fantasy world, then it's maybe like, this is the standard trope that's in nearly every fantasy thing of like, magic used to be great. We used to do all kinds of shit with yeah. magic. <laughs> And now we, we can lost now it. we can fire fireballs. And now there's just these spells in the player's handbook. Yeah. And there's a sense, uh, you know, whether you're talking Forgotten Realms and the Netherese Empire, or really, I mean, we'll just kind of like sit in. The Forgotten Realms is called the Forgotten Realms because there were so many realms that you've forgotten that that many of them existed. Like, yeah. go read your Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide and all those little sidebars where it's like, here's every Dwarven Empire that's existed, where they were and what there was. Here are all the Elven ones, here are all the Human ones. And you get a sense for that Faerun is a place that is, first off, old as shit. Yeah. And is home to so many ancient civilizations that have risen, had their heights, had their moment in the sun, and then collapsed. And their entire you know, infrastructure now is waiting to be rediscovered in dungeons and delves mm -hmm. and all these kinds of things. That if you're designing dungeons in Forgotten Realms, then you owe it to yourself and your players to like just look through that thing and go, well, this dwarven ruin is from the Delzun Empire. We know that because XYZ and it gives you a chance, maybe you've got a dwarf in the party or an archaeologist in the party or, or someone that would know this information. Little tidbits you can drop there. Reinforcing your setting as one that has history Mm -hmm. and that has weight and that con that things have happened and the consequences have borne out and the players are playing in that. Talking specifically about Forgotten Realms, I think that's a much 
richer way to play in that world. Yeah. Because otherwise, the Forgotten Realms has a tendency of just being like, it's fantasy theme land, and I'm going to go over here to knighthood land, and mm -hmm. later on we're going to go to pirate land, and yeah. now there's here's yeah. Viking... Yeah, we're going to go know, to northern barbarian Ice barbarian land. land. Ice barbarian land. Yeah. yeah. It's taking what's unique about the Forgotten Realms, which is this world that has experienced so many civilizations and seen their collapse and watched them rise to great heights and then fallen and then it's intermixed with the intervention of the gods and how they play into the setting that creates something that for me when I read like Grey Box Forgotten Realms it seemed like a wild dangerous place yeah. where no one bothers to build great civilizations anymore. They mm -hmm. just stay in their little towns or cities. Yeah, like they're city states. They're I mean, city states. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's like you got Waterdeep here and you got Silver Moon right. here and you know Luskin yeah. over here. Mm -hmm. Baldur's Gate. And then in between is a lot of trackless wilderness with tiny little communities yeah. and things, but they're either clients of a larger city state or, or are just, you know, fending for themselves mm -hmm. in this sort of wilderness. Yeah, I mean, you got what, Callum Sham down in the south. Sure. And it's yeah. still kind of a. Yeah, yeah, Kalimshan I think is like one city. I, I always get them, I always get Kalimshan and Zakara uh, mixed up a little bit. But yeah, yeah, that's that's sort of my impression of what the Forgotten yeah. Realms uh, was like. My grandfather used to tell the story. He he lived through the Great Depression. Uh -huh. uh, you know, he's like eight or nine when that happened. But he told the story like he remembered like Christmas before the Great Depression. They'd get like toys and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he just remembered one Christmas he got a wooden cutout elephant, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which he 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 actually re. re finished and fixed like a few years before he died and everything uh -huh. and he had it up on the shelf. A wooden cutout of an elephant and an orange. Yeah, and I that was, similar that stories. That was Christmas. That's similar stories. And that sort of like you can look at you can look at something like the Great Depression as a near apocalyptic event. And it, you can what if a, a great many number of things about who was elected to deal with it right, and the right. actions that are taken and, and you can spin out a scenario in which case the Great Depression is the end of the United States. Right. And that is a that qualifies sort of as a, a post apocalyptic or near post apocalyptic event. But Coming back to that resource scarcity, uh, one of the things that I liked about Midnight was that food and water were treasure. Yeah. You could give the party, you could say like, yeah, here's a sack of grain. This is like better than gold in this yeah. setting. You know, you can use it for yourself. You can give it to other people. It, it, it's, it's uh, food is power in Midnight because, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, the world is ruled over by the dark god Isridor. Traditional fantasy uh, games like Dungeons and Dragons usually feature spells that make these things which are otherwise seen as inconveniences. Running out of food, mm -hmm. running out of water, running out of whatever. So there's just a spell that'll cover it. Why don't, why don't you have a druid casting good berries? Everywhere? Right, or someone creating water. And you know, we, we talk about some of these things in our Tyranny of Fun episode, and, and specifically things of like encumbrance and, mm -hmm. and, and making sure that limitations are fun and engaging and reinforce the setting and are not like punitive. Um, but I think it's worthwhile if you're going to do this kind of like resource scarcity, we are scrounging for scraps uh, or, or you know, there's just not enough to go around, then if you're playing a traditional fantasy game like Dungeons & Dragons or, or many others, then you're going to have to make some hard changes to that. And you yeah. might have to say things like, yeah, any spell which creates food or water, it's gone. Gone. It's gone. Um, well, or or significantly mean, altered. Well, you know? yeah, because you one. I mean, because here's the thing. One could think that because if the world has been altered so much as it's hard to grow this stuff, who's to say that the weave of magic hasn't been altered in order to create it? Yeah, I mean, there's you know? a lot. There's so many different ways you can play it, and I, I think you can say like, yeah, the, you know, the magic that creates these things is, is not only weakened as well, but but it's. It's unreliable, mm -hmm. or the food that's created is not nearly as nourishing as, as real food, or something. Or personally, the way I would do it is I would just tell the players, like, I don't want these spells in the game because I am going for a specific feel for the game. Yeah. We're not going to worry about why they're not, or why no one's created them, or something. We're just going to accept it's not here. Spells that cure disease is another one, right? Like disease, sickness, illness, infection, all these kinds of things are usually, in terms of like the genre fiction of post-apocalyptic, you know, getting injured is a big deal. Usually it's something like, well, they're modern society and it's not anymore, so you know, you can't just go to a hospital or, or something like that. But it could be that way in your fantasy world where a breakdown of society has led to a breakdown of, of the, the magical uh, things that are put in place to prevent mass disease and epidemics mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, expanding further, any class that completely negates a, a mode of play from an absolute ability. Fifth edition is one of, those, one of these games that it has several abilities in it 
that I don't care for because they're absolutes and they shut off an option. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically of things like the alert feat, which is like not going to be surprised ever. ever. Um, and now there are ways around it, right? We can, we're not talking about the alert feed. You guys I'm sure will comment on it in the comments. Uh, <laughs> but it's also things like the Outlander's ability to find food or the Ranger's ability to never get lost. Ever. Ever. And if you're running a game in which resource scarcity is a, a, a feature of it, getting from place to place is a hassle, then uh, things like the Outlander or a Ranger or a Druid or, or if you're playing another version of D&D or another traditional fantasy game, whatever the uh, analogies are or analogs are in, in that one, um, are you're going to want to tweak them. And you might have to just be like, hey, either this is no longer an absolute, we're gonna, it's, some role is going to be involved, yeah. or we're going to just have to cut those things out. And if you want to play a ranger type character, you might have to be satisfied with a fighter who's skilled in nature and stealth. You're still good at tracking. You're still good at, at knowing the places best to find food. Right. But you're not guaranteed to like find food and like, oh, don't worry, we're going to go that way when we get out of here. Even yeah. though we've been doing all these switchbacks all day. Yeah. You know, in the mountains or whatever. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. there's there's the other way to go, right? Like, I my, land between two rivers, I lean into it. I don't care. The party takes Goodberry and create food and water. They've got a Leoman's tiny hut mm -hmm. and, and, and traveling through through the wastelands for them is not about whether they are going to survive or not. They have an edge because they have magic. Yeah. But I have built that into the world. Most settlements in the land between two rivers have someone there who is capable of providing magically those things that the community cannot provide for itself. Mm -hmm. Closing thoughts on the end of the apocalypse. Gosh. And it's setting. <laughs> and the settings thereof. And the settings thereof. I, you know, I, like I said, it, this is a, a genre that I find is, is broad. Right. right. We've talked about uh, nearly every, it seems like every major D&D &D setting uh, that we can talk about. The Ninth World is a really cool post-apocalyptic setting with, mm -hmm. with, you know, the, the millions and millions of years of, of history behind it. My final thoughts would simply be think about the apocalyptic events that may or may not have happened in your campaign world. How do they influence the setting now? Is, is, is there a way that they can directly influence the course of the game uh, that, that you're playing? Is there, is there some kind of event or plot or, or, or hook that you're working on that you can feature a post-apocalyptic event? And the other one would just be consider throwing one at your players and seeing how they react to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just like like most things, it's it's a tool for you to use if your campaign setting is getting stale, if it's getting boring, if it's getting kind of like uh, I don't, I'm not having as much fun. Throwing in world shaking, world changing events. Number one is more true to actual history, uh, and therefore your campaign setting will feel more. Uh, true to life yeah. uh, and more real, but it's also a great fun experiment to just try out. Almost all of these, with the exception of Mad Max, I don't give a fuck what's going on in this movie. I want someone to make a documentary about the world. Mm -hmm. It's like I watched The Road. And I was, dude, I'm the, literally the, just the, about to the, say The, the road. road is one of those where I watched I was like, God, this is bleak as fuck, and I loved it. I was like, oh God, it's so bleak. But at the same time, I'm just kind of like, you know what? I could really give a shit, two shits less. I want like, a, I want Werner Herzog to give me three hours. <laughs> On, on what the fuck's going on here. And the goddamn wind I, right, that I keeps want, coming around. Uh, yeah, I want, I want Adam Curtis to give me a 16 hour documentary series on the world of Mad Max. Give me Ken Burns's- Ken Burns's- Ken Postal. Burns's water world. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take Ken Burns' Walking Dead any day of the week. Just yeah. tell me what's going on in the world. I'll just sit there and, and watch, please.